let's talk about phagocytosis. So the first step of phagocytosis is chemotaxis, which means that the phagocyte will need to move to the site of the pathogenic invader. So this is moving to invader. All right, now once the phagocyte has reached the invader, the second step is that the phagocyte will have to attach to the pathogenic invader. As shown here, this macrophage in purple has special receptors on its surface that will bind to the pathogen. Now there's a couple of things to note about this attachment. If the pathogen is just entered the body recently, it is possible for the phagocyte to recognize it and engulf it. But this process is not very effective. What would be better is if you had the pathogen and it's already coated in antibodies, all right, that the host has made. So these antibodies could attach the pathogen or the pathogen uh, could come to the body and another protein that the host has made, and this protein is called C3B, it's a complement protein, C3B will also attach to the pathogen. Once either antibodies or C3B have attached to the pathogen, this makes it really easy for the phagocyte to come in and engulf. All right, so these are really happy phagocytes because they can easily recognize that this is a pathogen and it makes it a little bit easier for them to eat. So this process is called opsonization. Opsonization is a fancy word that makes, that means that the phagocyte can more easily engulf the pathogen. So to make easier to engulf. And like I said, there's two ways that opsonization can occur, either by antibodies attaching to the pathogen or complement protein C3B attaching to the pathogen. Okay, so now the macrophage or the neutrophil have attached to the pathogen, binded, bound to the receptors, and now the phagocyte will engulf the pathogen. So you can see in this picture, the pathogen enters into the phagocyte and it enters into this uh, membrane bound vesicle called a phagosome. So the phagosome is basically just this membrane bound vesicle that transports the pathogen into the, into the phagocyte. Once this occurs, another organelle called lysozyme, so ly lysosomes contain hydrolytic enzymes that will degrade all the macromolecules of the pathogen. And one of these enzymes includes lysozyme. So that's why lysosome sounds a lot like lysozyme. So these lysosomes will fuse with the phagosome. As you can see here, these little lysosomes will fuse with the phagosome and it will form what's called a phagolysosome. Inside the phagolysosome, now all these enzymes will come into play and they chop this pathogen up into a bunch of little pieces and then these pieces get expelled by exocytosis. So that is how phagocytosis occurs in those steps. Let's talk about the two main types of phagocytes and compare them. So there's two main phagocytes um, that we've learned about. The first are the macrophages. And the second group are the neutrophils. Now both of these are phagocytes, but they work very differently. First of all, the macrophages are, as, we've, as we know, are usually resident macrophages, meaning they're already residing in tissues in the body, waiting for an invader. 
whereas the neutrophils are more likely to be circulating, circulating in the blood and they be called in to a, to a site where a pathogen has, has entered. Macrophages can be recycled so they can be reused multiple times. If you look at this, at this cycle, this whole process can occur over and over and over again about 100 times. So a macrophage can, can digest and destroy about 100 pathogens at a time. Whereas neutrophils, they have those granules. Those granules contain all those hydrolytic enzymes. These can only be used once. So once a neutrophil has destroyed one pathogen, it's done, it's dead. It's used one time only, and then they die. So neutrophils live um, on a scale of maybe one to three days, whereas macrophages can live for weeks or maybe even months. Okay, so macrophages recycled multiple times, neutrophils granules are used once and then they die. So neutrophils have a very short lifespan, although their granules are very powerful. So these guys are great at coming in to fight an infection. Sometimes a macrophage alone is not enough to do the job. So we need to activate the macrophage. So an activated macrophage, I like to say it's kind of like a super macrophage, it's stronger. The way macrophages become activated is by helper T cells. So helper T cells are involved in activating macrophages and making them stronger. Sometimes multiple macrophages may fuse and when they fuse, they form what's called a giant cell. So a giant cell is basically a giant macrophage that can engulf more pathogens all at once. Finally, another thing that can happen is macrophages can form what's called a granuloma. Granulomas are a mix of macrophages, giant cells, and T cells. They all come together and form a granuloma. The purpose of a granuloma is to wall off a site of infection. So if there is a particular site where there's a lot of pathogens together in one place and the body needs to block these pathogens off, the granuloma can form. So although granulomas are helpful in that they wall off the site of infection, they can also be problematic because they could interfere with normal tissue function. I'll give you an example. Uh, sometimes with tuberculosis infections, if there's enough mycobacterium in the lungs, a granuloma can form. And what you end up seeing if you look um, under an, a chest x-ray is you can see these granulomas uh, forming in the lungs and they can interfere with normal tissue function. So that is the process of phagocytosis and some of the differences between neutrophils and macrophages.